right. Thank you for tuning in. This is Thomas Keegan, host of LibertarianProgressive.com as well as BlogTalkRadio.com forward slash election channel. So if you haven't listened in, we are conducting interviews with independent third party candidates who are on the ballot and who are the only third party um, option in their districts. And uh, today we have an interview with Sean Patrick House, Libertarian, U.S. House District 16 in Pennsylvania. So he's going to explain to us why he's the best candidate, and uh, you can find out more information at House, the number two, Congress2016.com. So his last name's House, and he's running for the House, and so it's House2, the number two, Congress2016.com, House to Congress. Um, And here he is calling in. So, hi, Sean. Hey, hey. Yeah, welcome. Welcome. And uh, so I've just given out your website, and thanks thanks for uh, joining us today. And so we can, um, I guess, like Thomas Jefferson said, educate and inform the public, but at least let them know what options are out there besides the status quo, Republicans and Democrats. And, um, and so on your website, you have a platform. And so I'd be remiss if I didn't ask you to go over your platform and your issues uh, as the first thing here. And, and if you don't mind, yeah, if you could tell us what you're running on and why you're better than the other candidates this year, 2016, November 8th. Um, hmm. So I've been involved with the cannabis hemp industries here in Pennsylvania for about 20 years. I own the Hempsel Pretzel Company. That's at Hempsels.com. I contract with Pennsylvania bakeries that do a hemp soft pretzel and this is all industrial hemp not medicinal cannabis so it's funny how this came about because our congressman joe pitts who had held this seat for 10 terms or 20 years uh was not seeking re-election and the hemp industries association had contacted me in the past because every time we'd write a letter about him holding things up in in committee, we'd get this form letter, thank you for your support of marijuana at this time, blah, 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 blah. And I didn't, I'm, I've been a struggling businessman for years, and I found out when I'd contacted him that he wasn't running. And I'm originally born from Coatesville, Pennsylvania, which is, again, outside of Philadelphia, and it's part of the 16th Congressional. And I thought, wow, um, Pennsylvania is going to be growing hemp here, even though it's a slow process. I feel like I've accomplished something. I'm a small business person. I have a Bachelor of Science degree in Computer Information Systems, and I've been involved with the Libertarian Party since 1992. So I did throw my hat in the ring last year, uh, November. Ken Krawchuk of the Libertarian Party was trying to convince me to run for lieutenant governor, and I was like, you know what? I think I can make more of a difference in this congressional race. And I am running against a Republican senator, Lloyd Smucker, who voted against SB3, which was the medical cannabis bill, and another young lady on the Democratic side, Christine Hartman. And I just think I'll be a better voice for the constituents of the 16th Congressional District. Um, I have a libertarian platform, but one of my main focuses is Uh, recognizing the absolute right of the individual to self-cultivate cannabis. Uh, This gets rid of our Pennsylvania state store mentality because if people have been against, um, I guess, decriminalizing or legalizing cannabis but in Pennsylvania, but they're seeing what Colorado is doing and they're making money. And so greed becomes a part of this equation and it's, uh, they want to heavily regulate it and control it and, Besides all the other issues with education and health care and pensions um, and the wars and no one speaking out against that, I feel that I am the best candidate to represent the people, not the corporate interests uh, that control a lot of our Congress, especially in Pennsylvania. All right. Well, that sounds great, Sean. And um, so you are the only third option in your district. And um and so you did put on here, I mean, to um, so localize education, just reading the highlights here, uh, downsize the U.S. military, increase diplomacy. Um, yeah, actually, if you don't mind uh, going into that a little bit, um, you know, what are some of the main points?
points, benefits, um, you know, for America, uh, downsizing the U.S. military, increasing diplomacy? Well, you know, look at what we're having with all these refugee, the refugee crisis. And why do we have refugees? Because we're out there bombing. Uh, we're all over the Middle East. We are all over the world. Uh, our empire is basically uh, too widespread. And where's the money coming from? Uh, you know, my father served in Vietnam, and here we're in Afghanistan longer than that. And what for? Uh, we're looking at providing uh, military aid, $38 billion to Israel. I think we're we're sending $8 million a day, basically. And, and again, where is this money coming from but the taxpayers? And we're going to be needing funds for refugees. Well, how about we stop what we're doing uh, with supplying both sides of a conflict with weapons, uh, being the policeman of the world, back off from that, uh, I think we could decrease terrorism, and that certainly has increased, and that's basically because we are all over the world trying to be the policemen of the world. And there's just a lot of uh, things going behind the scenes that the average person is not aware of. So we need to extend diplomacy and peace and stop with this bombing mentality uh, that we have, and a lot of again is over oil and control of natural resources, all in the name of national security. So, again, the, the people in the 16th congressional district are English, Amish, Mennonite, a lot of farming, and um, I think we're we've just had the wool pulled over our eyes for too long. Uh, we haven't adhered to President Eisenhower's farewell address warning us about the military industrial complex in 1954 and here we are you know 45 50 years later and things continue to be the way they are so i certainly want to be that candidate of peace i believe in a strong national defense but that is not again perpetuating wars and and getting in the middle of civil wars uh as we've been doing whether it's through the cia whether it's through the pentagon um, or whether it's through corporate interest. It's amazing that we have so many paid um, private contractors out there making more than U.S. troops. And when we have, what, 22 veterans a day committing suicide, that does not say much for what we're sending them into uh, without any strong objectives, without any targets and and this thing of terrorism versus criminality. So there are other ways of dealing with these conflicts uh, versus dropping massive amounts of bombs on uh, citizens in Syria, Afghanistan, and the such. Uh, yeah, so we can choose between an empire versus a democratically elected republic. And, um, and, and you did mention earlier about being a small business owner and um and so if you don't mind i'm just going to go through some topics here um what about um small and mid-sized businesses uh you know what would you do to be an advocate to representative for small and business small and mid-sized businesses and how would that affect uh you know everyone wait I, like I said, I've been involved with the hemp industry for about 20 years, and I don't understand how anyone today can really create a business by themselves without seeking subsidies in one way or another. Um, part of the business issue deals with our monetary supply, and that's something that Congress has abrogated their responsibility dealing with currency and coinage. You know, we're, we're working with the Federal Reserve. So right off the start, we are working with a fiat currency, which is is not helping. Um, you know this this issue with the interest rates and all this behind the scenes manipulation. We, I'm certainly against big government, and I'm certainly against bigness in the sense of monopolies. And I just continue to see further consolidations. We we need to free up a lot of of uh, rules and restrictions so we can foster a sense of of people getting involved to take care of problems and provide services and issues. I mean, even the Ubers of the world and 
And folks mm-hmm. that are trying to be competitive, trying to show a new way of doing things, are, are still being met with a lot of resistance. Uh, again, I'm working on the congressional level, but it, it boils all the way down to zoning and, and things of that issue with with folks trying to create a job and how they can go about it. And it, it's it's tougher. And and somehow in, in my congressional position, I need to make it easier for these folks to 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 be creative and 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 take the lead and create more smaller businesses versus bigger businesses and and get more choice into the equation uh and and help you know budding entrepreneurs become you know filling filling these needs um versus consolidation as we see over and over with big box stores and things of that nature so there's a lot of work, and I don't obviously have all the answers, but it's pulling the right people around me and, and putting that forward versus our typical Coke and Pepsi, Democrat and Republican um, mentality of of how and, and what should be done with businesses. So, you know, again, I don't have all the an- answers here, Thomas, but I certainly want to be that voice and start thinking outside of the box for creativity. And certainly the power of the Internet has helped but here again we have in the name of national security our presidential candidates trying to limit the internet and this has certainly helped level the playing fields uh when it comes to people getting involved and creating services um and and even our our educational system which needs a lot to be desired uh we need to get outside of the box and and have children coming up being able to to work at solving problems versus just taking tests so there's a lot to be done but it's certainly multifaceted yeah and it seems like we're having a self-perpetuating status quo i I mean because you know we're talking about the importance of competition and so maybe the key to that is some more competition in our politics besides just Republicans and Democrats. I mean, like you said, Coke and Pepsi, um, you know, maybe it's time for some Arizona iced tea and kombucha and, and, you know, whatever else. Uh, Yeah. I'm I'm right there with water. I mean, I keep when we're out campaigning, I just tell people we're tired of Coke and Pepsi. My, my 10 year old knows, and I don't drink either one, but you know, it's too much syrup. Uh, We want water. We want clean pure water. I want to get to the root of issues. Um, you know, the part of anarchy is getting to the root of the issue, not glossing over as our typical politicians are. I, I feel I'm more of a statesman. I, I feel, again, that I'm speaking for the people. Uh, we're looking for justice and not to continue this status quo and getting away from our constitutional republic and rule by law you know where there's two tiers, uh, whether it's in business and or whether it's politics and obeying the law and enforcing the law, but the good laws, you know, not fraud and and stealing. Those type of laws, you know, need to be enforced versus some people getting to get out of jail free or being able to pollute carte blanche without suffering consequences. Um, I'm I'm into renewable agriculture, you know, and that's part of the hemp issue is renewable agriculture and and the mentality here is uh you know, a minimum of 20 acres. You know, if you want to grow hemp, they want to thumbprint you, you know, and and hemp needs to be treated like tomatoes. And and yeah. we don't have that attitude and and again, I want to speak for the people kind of the the Lorax speaking for the trees. <laughs> <laughs> Well, hemp, hemp, besides the Bill of Rights, is uh, just as American as American pie. I mean, so and, and talking about equality under the law, um, and maybe this somewhat relates to that. I see on your website here pensions. Uh, could you uh, expand well, on pensions? I, I, I'll tell you what. My my feeling, my gut feeling is no one deserves a taxpayer funded pension. Bottom line. Now. We know this isn't going to happen overnight. We're we're peeling back a massive onion that has many layers. But you know, if I get elected to Congress, and and that's the intention, I like Ron, Congressman Ron Paul 
do not want to take a pension. I am getting paid plenty enough, plenty that I should be able to open my own 401k. In Pennsylvania, uh, two-thirds of a teacher's pension is funded through the Pennsylvania taxpayers. Uh, this needs to end. They need to set up their own 401, private 401ks. Uh, right now, I think Pennsylvania has an $18 billion unfunded pension liability, and that's with PennDOT and, I guess, teachers and a bunch of other you know, whether it's Liquor Control Board or all these other agencies. But we need to stop. We cannot perpetuate this thing with you – know, this is certainly a, the best way, instead of having a con-con con, constitutional convention and enacting term limits, let's stop giving these guys taxpayer-funded pensions. Now, the fellow that I plan on replacing, Representative Joe Pitts, Retiring is going to get ninety thousand dollars a year um, as a from the a, as a pension for serving in Congress. This not, does not include his military pension. This does not include his teacher's pension. That I, I don't care who you are, you don't deserve it. I mean, yeah. I, I'm right next to a, a fire company um, in Columbia, Pennsylvania. These guys are all volunteers. They're not getting pensions, and they go out and risk their life daily. Yet we have congressmen that don't show up for votes, that are more worried about getting elected every two years, and they're going to get a taxpayer-funded pension for the rest of their life. And we need to stop that. Uh, that's got to be the new course for the new millennium here versus the old school of paying people for serving – and then paying for the rest of their life, including health care and, and other benefits. I just don't think people deserve that. Creating a class structure, which is not American in my view. Yeah, and let's let's try to um, – I want to get into the financial type of issues here and maybe combine a couple. And um, How about the national debt – government financial transparency and if somehow you can throw crony capitalism into that as well well it's interesting because we are always accused that capitalism is is cronyism and actually it's the the combination of the government and private sector working together to exclude competition as we were talking about earlier so we we need any agency that is getting public funds needs to be as transparent as you and I, that if the IRS was going to audit us, we have to give them everything. But yet again, we have agencies that don't provide this type of information. We have certainly wasteful spending, whether it's the Pentagon can't find X trillions of dollars, whether that was pre-911 or just last month or two months ago. And and it, it kind of deals in the tax situation. My attitude is if you're going to collect a tax, it needs to go to what that project was funded for, not into a big slush fund. And it seems like whether it's Pennsylvania, the Commonwealth, or the National, we have this big slush fund that we lose money constantly and things are not accounted for, or representatives or bureaucrats are not held accountable for mismanagement. And then again, that needs to change. And under a libertarian administration, or if we start electing more libertarians that are not interested in being career politicians but statesmen, that people are going to go in and serve and then set it up for the next liberty candidate to take over, we can start demanding that we be served – and that's certainly through transparency versus serving as things have been reversed in our federal government grows. And what is it now? The biggest employer is our federal government, <laughs> our government agencies. Is that is that what America is all about? I, I don't think so. So a lot of that has to change. And, and certainly part of that, as I had mentioned earlier, has to deal with our 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 way that we're exchanging goods and services and that's through you know our fiat currency losing value. Um, I'm certainly a big believer, like Congressman Paul has talked about, competitive 
cryptocurrencies, commodity currencies, Bitcoin, uh, these type of, of ways. But transparency is a key, uh, whether it's my congressional seat, whether it's an agency or the Pentagon or, you know, whatever it is, there needs to be more transparency because evil can't be done in the dark. And we certainly need to shine more light on the way our government is running. We've got to get into the sausage grinder and see exactly what's being ground up. So we as yeah. citizens know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we, um, you know, we can be audited from head to toe. So, I mean, it's uh, and we're supposed to be, you know, the ones who are being served. And uh, so um, there's been a record amounts of uh, secrecy in government the last, you know, couple of years and decades. Um, uh, so we got about 20 minutes left here. So I just want to cover a um, couple other issues here. How about um, one of the items you put on the website is honor and reconcile our U.S. treaties with Native Americans. Do you mind uh, going on, you know, explaining that a little bit? Well, it, it's interesting. And again, it kind of goes back to the Hemp Industries Association. And I met Alex White Plume um, of the Lakota Nation up at the Boston Hemp Industries Association. He had been one of the first um, that in 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 his area, and this I guess was in I'm tr- trying to think how many years ago it's been, maybe ten or twelve years ago, to get the permission from the locals, to get the permission from the tribes and the state to grow hemp. And lo and behold, the federal agents came in, tore all his stuff down, um, threatened him to put him in jail if he was, and this is agricultural hemp. This has nothing to do with medicinal, recreational, spiritual cannabis, but an agricultural product. And, you know, you, you read enough books and you find out how, Really, I I just finished John Quincy Adams' book, The Militant. Uh, Very good book. But we found out that our founding fathers really didn't have any... The the founding fathers promised the Indians whatever they wanted to hear to be able to get land and resources. And they had total disregard for them because they were not stewards of the land. They were nomadic tribes. And so they were held in disregard, and we signed treaties. Now, we're signing national treaties. Our drug control treaty in 1968, you know, is, is, is agreements between nations. And here we've signed treaties with the natives, the, the, the true Native Americans. Now, again, it can all be disputed whether the Irish were here, the Swedes were here, or whoever. But regardless, we signed treaties and we did not honor those treaties and continue to take land, and they continue to do this to the Navajo and to get mineral rights, just like we're doing throughout the rest of the world, and we need to honor that. These people need to be treated as sovereign individuals. If they're on the reservation, they should have the freedom to do what they want to do, whether it's grow cannabis, but they're not. They're under the Bureau of of Indian Affairs or whatever, and it's all corrupted. And it's really sad because we've annihilated people, but this has happened throughout the world. And and part of that issue is through manifest destiny. And it's just a sad thing when you really speak with the people um, and we're talking about liberty, liberty has to come to all people, you know, black, white, red, yellow. uh, Everyone needs to be treated fairly. And certainly the libertarians welcome all races, all tribes uh, into the freedom movement. And so I put in there that we need to honor our treaties uh, with these folks, especially the folks that are still here. So that that was that's what I added into as part of my platform on a federal level. Uh, Even the issue with the Dakota, the the access line that's going through now with these pipelines, you know, Mm -hmm. where it's really the big multinationals that are 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 reaping the benefits pipelines through waterways that can break. And and they're not being held uh, responsible. They they have limited liability, you know, when it comes to this pollution and and killing our waterways. And and we need clean water more than we need oil. I mean, I know there's a lot of people that are, might argue against this, but 
folks that are going to do that type of work need to be held accountable when there is that spill, and they're really not. And the Native Americans want clean water, and if they have an oil spill in there, it's going to ruin it, just like they've done to the Navajo reservations, uh, the territories down there. So that that's why I said about honoring the treaties. Yeah, and, and how can we expect others to honor treaties with us if we don't honor them with others? And uh, so how about, um, let's see here, election reform. Um, do you have any thoughts about election reform? Well, certainly. Um, now, I'm I'm included in our debates October 10th through Great. the Chamber of Commerce and the awesome. Lancaster newspapers. Um, why aren't our presidential candidates included in the debates when they made all 50 ballot access? Uh, the polling is corrupt. The electoral system, I, I do agree with. I mean, we don't want mobocracy. It's real easy to sway the public's opinion when they're more interested in the Steelers and Phillies or the Florida Marlins, you know, versus their civic responsibility. So, and that gets into competing education, you know, so people want to learn about civics versus, you know, things that are distractions. Um, so we need to reform that. If you're on the ballot, you should be in the debates. That's a no brainer. Um, we, in Pennsylvania, working with the Constitutional Party and the Green Party, got a superior judge, a superior court judge, to lower our ballot access where we actually needed 26,000 signatures, which means we needed 30-some thousand because we needed to have that buffer. Buffer, um, yeah. Right, and the judge, God bless him, uh, reduced our ballot access to 5,000. Now, the, the National LP had already spent $62,000. And this is what happens mm. to us libertarians every year. Is we have, and we're all volunteers. We're all working full-time jobs. And here we have to get all these signatures. And I don't mind getting signatures because, to me, that's part of campaigning. You know, getting out there, meeting people, getting some type of commitment. Excessive ballot access signatures are not free and fair ballot uh, rules that are in our Constitution. And that's what we were looking for. And even my opponent, the Republican Senator Lloyd Smucker, voted against this or would not put this through. So he had a vested interest to make sure, again, there's not competition. And that's what it all uh -huh. boils down to, making the best, getting the best from folks, whether it's our elected representatives or business, is through competition. And so certainly ballot access is one of those issues, and free and, and equal access has to be that other thing. Because, again, we need more than McDonald's and Burger King, which I detest. We need more than Coke and Pepsi, which I detest. And we need more representative democracy or more representation for all our independents and folks that do not subscribe to the two old parties. Yeah, and I would say, I mean, as far as that, um, vote that he did against competition, you know, he would have looked better supporting it, even if he didn't think that, you know, it would benefit him. And uh, so, I mean, if, you, you know, uh, it just shows that, you know, he's in favor of fairness and equal playing field, not results, but a, a more level playing field. What about um, trade? Uh, you know, what are your thoughts on uh trading with other countries i love it i love it i you know i go up to the porcupine festival in lancaster new hampshire and we trade my hemp soft pretzels for silver coins uh all kinds of stuff and it, it should be the way same way with with the rest of the world you know it, it's funny that somehow china is kind of an enemy of ours although apples are made in china we borrow from the chinese um Politics equals control, and I, I detest it. And certainly we want to trade, but we should not be creating rules and regulations that end up driving our manufacturing base to other countries. Um, and so we we need fair trade. I'm, I was never a big fan of NAFTA. Uh, I don't know enough about the TPP, but it seems odd that 
companies have the ability to sue us if they don't get into, you know, get what they bargain for through treaties or however that works. So, but mm. I certainly, um, you know, want fair trade, and I'm one that thinks that things need to be labeled correctly too. If if our chicken is being sent over to China to be processed and then sent back here, I want to know that. You know, I don't want to know that it, w- it came from Arkansas, the pork, and then was processed in some other country. That, that's not helping me as a diligent consumer be aware of what I'm consuming. So I'm all for fair trade, but certainly tell me where it's coming from, who I'm dealing with, so I have a choice, again, gets back to competition. And, yeah, and, and truthful so, advertising as well. Right, 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 right. I, I, I'm not into mandating necessarily. I mean, it's like the GMO issue. And as a manufacturer, I do my own due diligence without being told so I can tell the consumer, hey, we're using hemp seed that is non-GMO. You didn't have to mandate that uh, for me. But that's, as a manufacturer, I want to be as truthful to the customer so they we're building relationships, you know, and I want long-term customers. So, but I, I do want the best price and I want quality when it comes that way. So yes, I'm, I'm all for fair trade if there ever is such a thing. And, you know, that is one of the powers that we have for tariffs, you know, to raise revenue for the proper role of government. But, you know, it, it just seems odd that we've driven all our manufacturing base or a big bit bit of it overseas. So I, I you know, I, I believe in fair trade, but we need opportunities here so we can create that strong manufacturing base that we used to have. Yeah, just one quick point about GMO labeling. I mean, if someone gets a patent for something that's it no longer technically is what it originally, you know, was thought to be if it has a patent. So if I had some special kind of tomato and, and if I got a patent on that kind of tomato, then I should have to label it what it is. I can't have it both ways. Either I have the patent and then so it's not necessarily a tomato anymore or I don't get to patent it, you know. Um, so well, and, uh, and I'll, I'll tell you what, Thomas, that, that goes into the hemp seed and my biggest concern over the last 20 years, and I've been talking about this consistently, if they go to hempsouls.com, you can see my news clip section from 1997 onward. But I've always known that Monsanto is going to be end up controlling the seed. And part of my issue is freeing the seed, you know, and that the farmers have the absolute right to grow seed. It doesn't have to go through the seed dealer, you know, and, and that goes back to having that that freedom to be able to grow one acre of hemp for seed versus a minimum of 20 acres, which is corporate ag. And we have this attitude of, of politics and control and, you know, making it so you have to be a big person versus a bunch of smaller places. And people should have that right to be able to grow in their gardens, cannabis, you know, or tomatoes or be self-sufficient. You know, and if they yeah. want to trade their tomatoes, <laughs> great. And we're we have a massive tomato uh, area here in Washington Borough, Pennsylvania, some of the best in the United States. And Lancaster County is the number one non-irrigated farming area in the whole United States, and that's one of the beauties of living in this area. I say, in a complicated world, we can still make things simple again. So, what other great. questions? And by the way, have Bear, I think Bear just. Uh... Just bought out Bob Monsanto, Monsanto for sixty six oh. billion dollars or something. Yep. Yeah. Well, I have one other question and um and see if we can fit in another one after this, but one other main one. And I think you might have touched on this when you mentioned John Quincy Adams, but um I did want to ask uh, you know, who's some of your favorite past or present people elected or not? Well, I, I certainly have a lot more respect for uh reading John Quincy Adams book. Um, I certainly like Jefferson, um, it's President Jefferson getting back to the smallest level of government, the Canton, the smallest unit. I'm reading Louis Brandeis's book, who was one of our Supreme Court justices, called The Prophet. Very interesting. I don't agree with everything, but again, I, I like his anti-bigness, anti-monopoly, how he stood up to federal federal. Um, 
Frederick or um, oh good lord Roosevelt, um, you know because he just didn't go along with with how things were. Um, oh, uh, I certainly like Lysander Spooner. I've read some of his works. Um, I'm trying to think who else. I mean, those are a few of the folks. I I might consider myself, you know, a Jeffersonian Democrat in the true sense and a, a Quincy Federalist in another sense because I, I can see that balance where the state certainly could do things better, you know, to a degree uh, as long as they're accountable. And, and you know, I, lo- I love Benjamin Franklin. I've read his books, uh, Pennsylvania Fella. Um, mm-hmm. I'm trying to think who else. Oh, I, I mean, even uh, Chief Joseph of the Nez Pierce Indians. I mean, I'm I'm kind of diverse. It's the same with my music. I I grew up on rock and roll, but I like all kinds of music. It just depends on my mood and my attitude and all that stuff. But yeah. Well, Sean, and let me just uh, we have uh, three minutes remaining. Um, any issues that uh, we didn't touch upon this evening that, uh, you know, any final words of, of wisdom and uh, and maybe any appeals to, um, you know, your district there, district number 16 in Pennsylvania? Well, if if people want to stop this cycle of insanity with our Democrat, Republican, left, right, we need to think more in the sense of authoritarian versus libertarianism. And that's what we're working towards. We've got to break this left-right paradigm, in, paradigm and that's, that is happening. Um, but definitely go to my website. We, can, we need volunteers. We have about 333 polls to cover. A hundred major polls will give us enough votes. If people knew I was running, I would get their vote. Um, I, I have no vested interest in getting rich off of politics. I'm looking out to do the best for my daughter, my family, my community. Keep it local. Have faith in yourself. Join the Libertarian Party. See us at lppa.org. I am the state chair of the Libertarian Party of Pennsylvania. My goal is to get us up to 100,000 registered. We're up to about 50,000 registered voters now. I really appreciate your time, uh, Thomas. Thanks for reaching out to me. My number is 1-800-USE-HEMP in Pennsylvania. We do ship direct. Um, as it gets colder, we will ship the frozen pretzels. And um, I don't know what else to tell you other than keep keep doing what you're doing. All right. Well, Sean Patrick House, Libertarian, U.S. House, District Number 16, Pennsylvania. That's House, H-O-U-S-E, the number two, Congress. You want to send House to Congress, 2016.com. House to Congress, 2016. Dot com. And thank you so much for you taking the time on this late Monday evening. Um, you know, it's almost 10 p.m. And, and we appreciate it. And, uh, you know, so best wishes and good luck in your campaign. Thanks so much. Thank you, Thomas, very much. Appreciate it. All right. Take care, Sean.